It's no one don't care. Snipe. Fuck you. you. See ya. Let's go. Innovation is in our veins. Soon the whole world will know our names. Sharing our knowledge and freedom reign. We give for the people. You know it's our way. Setting foundations is part of the dream. It doesn't matter if you're new to the game. Listen up now, because we all going to say. Ugh. Elevate. 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 Higher. Elevate. 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 Higher. We going to rise up. We are gonna shine, work through adversity, stay on the grind, elevate, elevate, this is our time, elevate, elevate. Welcome to Elevate Podcast, everyone. It's so great to have you all on one more time. It's your boy, Josh. And Reg. And we're grateful to be back on with you yet again. We have, uh, you know, we had, we started this one off where it just seemed like you were having an aneurysm at six in the morning. Well, that's about where our world's at right now. And that's what we're getting into. There is a plethora of topics to get into. Obviously, it was great to have Sheena on last week and kind of talk through local businesses and what they're doing, what she's doing with Made of Local and all of that. But we're getting right back into what we do best, covering topics that are happening locally, nationally, and internationally. And this is one thing we've noticed. Reg and I were talking and we realized that over the past six months, I'd say, we've been trying to figure out our identity here as a show. What do we want to do? Where are we going? And those who've been with us since the beginning know that this has started off as a business marketing design podcast <laughs> and then slowly turned into a news podcast. And uh, those who've been with us, you, can, you probably have noticed that we've probably looked like we've seemed like we've had an identity crisis and not knowing where we want to go with this. Uh, we've tried all kinds of different topics and things we want to touch on. And uh, this week I went through the data, went through the analytics. And after having conversations anecdotally with some of you, we've officially decided we are going to be a new show. We're just going to accept it for what it is. The Elevate Podcast is now a new show where we will be talking about local politics, provincial politics, federal politics, international politics, culture, different types of issues that are going on. Because honestly, that's what y'all have been tuning in for. For whatever reason, you want to <laughs> you want to give us that attention. Uh, it is something that is like, you know, obviously it's a, a side fun hustle of mine where I love politics, I love talking culture ish, cultural issues and things that are going on. And that nature is something we both like doing. It's not our main thing, but it's our side thing. And y'all love that about us and love to hear whatever we we're coming across and what we're learning and then talking about those issues. So we're going to give that to y'all. It's a weird one. I'll admit we're starting off. You guys know this. We're not journalists. <laughs> Don't claim to be journalists. We're just two guys with microphones Two white guys with microphones who tend to tick off people in media uh, who apparently they still write about it, about us in their bios. So Right. I mean, that's, I think, the biggest shout out is the fact that this individual who is a journalist, uh, who makes a point of uh, making sure that everybody knows that they are a respected and award-winning journalist, uh, likes to quote things that we say <laughs> and then and then use it as fodder for their for their social media so i love that for us exactly and so if, for those who've been with us from the beginning well we love you those who've been with us for maybe a couple months a week whatever it is we're happy to have you we're gonna be talking about all kinds of things a couple things that we're going to address first off is yeah we are going to obviously do this show once a week as it has been uh, talking about news and things are happening over the past week secondly though to those who are our members, we're taking a bit of a, a left turn, right turn, whatever you want to say. Uh, as me and Reg, uh, our lives have got abundantly more more hectic and crazy as we're both really trying to like push to get our stuff off the ground um, with e each other's respected businesses or respective businesses. We will be foregoing um, members episodes uh, just uh, for the time being. Not going to be forever, but we will be canceling it. So uh, you'll be getting your money back or if you have spent it, whatever it is, uh, we'll be uh, fin having our last members only episode at the end of September and then October hits. That'll be on the end of that. We'll be back to just doing kind of these Monday, Tuesday episodes. And then from time to time, maybe once a month or once every couple months, we'll be dropping a full, um, full blown interview with someone like Sheena Russell we did last week and see how that all goes. And that is the new structure of our show. And that's what we get into. Mm -hmm. Reg, how you feeling, big dog? Good. And I, I just want to say, like, big shout out to Shana Russell um, because, um, honestly, I went out, I bought the Made With Local Bars. I enjoyed them. I liked them. And then I used, actually, the Wolfville Farmer's Market website. I used a lot of the tools she, she gave us. So I'm really thankful for that. So anytime we find somebody in the community that I'm, like, really jazzed about or that you're really jazzed about, we're going to bring them on. And I know those aren't the ones that do, don't, like, don't do the best for our listeners, but I mean, they really enrich our lives. So, 
And this is for us. <laughs> yeah, straight up. And you're not wrong. So you know, we're going to keep these Monday and Tuesday episodes news only, uh, cultural issues only. Uh, but from time to time, as Reg says or said, we're going to bring, bring people on um, outside of these episodes. There's going to be an additional episode that we're going to throw into it later in the week or something like that uh, from time to time to see how that goes. And those are for, to be honest, just that's for me and Reg, really. Um, yeah. We think they're really interesting. And, and to those who do listen to those episodes, um, there's are for you as well. But and, and there's a lot of gold there too, right? And the other thing that I think we talked about that is going to be fun is be on the lookout every once in a while. We'll drop a, a spicy 20-minute episode on just a, a hot topic of the day where I frantically text Josh and like, do you see this thing? <laughs> this makes me so mad. And then you get on the phone and you're like, yeah, me too. <laughs> Let's yell into microphones about it. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up, yeah, that's going to happen quite a bit. Uh, yeah, we'll be doing that too on the, on the go. And uh, that's kind of... Our promise to you is that's what's happening now. And uh, we are going to keep that as the identity moving forward and uh, giving you more of what you love. The analytics say it. You told us, but the, by the way that you consume content, that's the way we're going now. So yeah. here we go. So to answer your original question, I'm doing okay. I'm doing yeah. pretty good. I think I was a little bit burnt out on the weekend. Uh, I did a full week last week um, of distance live education, eight hours each day. Jeez. Um getting my evaluation cert- certification so that I can be a fully fledged certified program evaluator. And uh, that will happen in March after I finish my capstone project. So yeah, just a, a little burnt out going back to school again. Yeah. <laughs> Things are getting crazy. Over yeah. There. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was good though. It was really good. It helped me uh, kind of dive back into that work again. Cause I kind of took a little break there when I, I left my, my job before and so it took a little bit of a, a break over the summer and then diving back into that kind of world again was, uh, it was good, but it was definitely like, whoa, oh yeah. <laughs> this is what that's like. Yeah, exactly. Totally. So, but uh, yeah, I'm feeling like that intro though a little bit, a little bit all over the place. There was so much happening. Like today I ended up just like going kayaking on the lake beside my house and I was just like, we need this. <laughs> we need a break. We need the sun, no hurricane, just on the lake in the kayak had the little one with me. She was uh, not really thrilled about the life jacket that she had on because it was a little bit snug around her, but uh, we wanted to keep her safe. So she just had to deal with it. <laughs> nice. I love that you're getting some use out of that kayak, sir. Oh, yes. There's some drama around that kayak. So I'm glad that you were using it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have two kayaks now. Oh. So there, there are two kayaks. <laughs> wow. So how did Jen pull that one off on you? Oh, no, it was, I, I wanted the kayaks too. Oh, so. he did you? Wow. Yeah. Could, yeah. could have fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I traded like my motorcycle insurance in for, ah. for kayaks. And so that's, that's how that balanced out, which I'm very sad because of course, um, one of my closest friends, he was just like, get a motorcycle. It's happening in two weeks. We'll go for like a Thanksgiving ride. And like, and he's like, what's that? And I'm like, I can't go for a ride. And he's like, what are you saying? You speak like, like a man. I'm like, I can't go for a ride. I cancel my insurance. <laughs> he's like, why did you do that? And I was like, well, it was expensive. It was super expensive. He's like, well, how much was it? And I was like, it was like getting on two grand. And hold up for the year. Two grand for the year yeah. for motorcycle insurance, dude. Yeah. And so Gee. the reason that's more being, than my car. Yeah. The, well, yeah, the reason being is because motorcycles have a higher likelihood of, like, fatal accident, right? Also, I, because you don't have, I see your confused face, because you don't have um, any kind of tin box around you, right? So what, what do you have to do with auto insurance? That's my thing. Like, they're insuring the vehicle, not your life. Oh, no, it's, it's everything. So if you get an injury, like, mm-hmm. they have to pay for that. Do if, they? Oh, yeah. Like when I had my car accident back like nine years ago, like I broke everything in my body. They paid for all the rehab, all the, like they paid for a $10,000 tooth that I now have. Like they paid for everything. So they cover all my injuries. They cover the injuries of the other person that's affected and they cover both vehicles, right? If you're at fault. So that makes no business sense to me, but (laughs) fair enough. 
I actually didn't realize that. I really thought that they just, they take care of the car. You're on your own with like your health insurance or whatever. That's no, what that no, 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 no. So yeah. So when I, when I, like I said, I had a brutal accident. They covered the ambulance. They covered everything in the hospital. Um, they covered, uh, like I said, this tooth that I lost. So this guy right here, um, they were going to give me like one of those like plates that you can put in people remove their teeth. I was like, absolutely not. I was like, put a spike in my head and put a tooth on it. <laughs> I want the, I want the most expensive, <laughs> fanciest tooth you can possibly it's put in there. got some grills. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm walking around with $10,000 in my head right now. <laughs> Gee. But, um, what's your life insurance? Then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my life insurance is quite high actually. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I had that accident so before it used to be like after seven years uh, an accident was wiped off your record they've extended it to 10 ah. so that yeah so that was so a year screwed yeah so i've still got another year <laughs> another two yeah another year so this is why you know the exact year at this point yeah it? exactly <laughs> because you're counting down the days yeah it's december like, 2014 was when i had that accident on christmas eve so uh Merry christmas eh? yeah so now I'm looking at uh, December 2024 going, okay, that's when my insurance is going to be a lot nicer. And then the other problem was, is I got a speeding ticket. <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> How much above? Um, so the one in Quebec was, I think it was like 20 above. So that one wasn't bad because that was rush hour. Um, we were coming back from Tremblant and heading back to Nova Scotia. And we were just like on the bridge doing the same speed as everybody else. And they looked and then went, ah, Nova Scotia plates. Got them. Perfect. <laughs> Pulled me over. And I was like, sir, like literally everyone around us was traveling at the same speed. He goes, I do not care. Um, this is Quebec. We, you know, followed the rules here. I don't know do what you? you do in, in Nouvelle Ecosse, you know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> cool. Thanks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you, sir. Thanks for the ticket. And then the one I most recently got was in New Brunswick, um, traveling back from my parents' place. And uh, we were like trying to hit the border in time that would line up with the baby's like wake cycle. So she was asleep in the car and we were like, okay, if we get to the border by like this time, um, she can wake up, we'll feed her and it will be like a nice little rest stop. So I was giving it to her. And, uh, this time the cops in New Brunswick actually took pity on me because I was going way, way, way too fast. I deserved the ticket that I got. And, uh, I actually deserved a lot more of ticket than what I got, but he took pity on me and he's like, I see that you are a young family and money is not easy to come by these days. So he's like, I'm writing you the lowest ticket I can possibly give you. He's like, just slow the heck down. And I was like, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. <laughs> Dude, oh, man, that guy take more pity on you than I would have. Uh, oh, like, yeah. Like, I don't care if you're a young family. Clearly, you don't care much about your family's life. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> That's where I would have went with it. Yeah. No, it's it's hard because, like, I after driving in Germany, I was just like, why isn't it all like this? Like, why can't we just go as fast as we want to go? It's like that libertarian in me that's just coming out where I'm just like, I want to drive 200 kilometers down the highway. That's not what I was doing. PS just for anybody. <laughs> just 170. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was like, like high one forties. So, but, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> you and your Tesla. And we, uh, almost smoked somebody in a crosswalk. What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, you're not so innocent over there. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. But I drive the speed limit every day. Good. Right on 50. If it's a 50, it's a 50. Not 49, not 51, it's a 50. Mm -hmm. But if it's 100, it's 100, not 101, not 99, 100. I always play by the rules. That is the biggest load of BS I've heard in a long time. <laughs> Sue me. <laughs> I'll take it up in court. Oh my God. Let's what are you, go. American? <laughs> Talk about my libertarianism. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. go. I'll defend yeah. myself. Yeah, live free or die, right? Woo! <laughs> Gee, what an intro <laughs> that was. 15 minutes in, still haven't talked to anything, and it's going to be a long episode here, folks. Boy. Yes. We have some stuff to talk about. Oh, my God, yeah. So first off, 
where do we want to start? We got a lot. <laughs> people don't know. We got a long list of things we want to get into or have things that we could get into. And I'm thinking Michael Chong. Do we want to get into Michael Chong? Yeah, for sure. Because that's the one that I don't really know a lot about. So I'd, I'd like to hear what's going on with that. And if uh, listeners haven't heard anything about that, it might be nice for them to, to get caught up as well. Absolutely. Let's do this. So Michael Chong, let's pull her up, is an MP here in Canada, conservative MP, who was, a, who was uh, attacked or targeted by Chinese uh, diplomats to put some pressure on him and his family, uh, his family who lived in China, and try to essentially push on him, pressure him a little bit to allow them to have some impact on um, Canada's political system. Obviously, there was a lot of news up here about that, and you know, Chinese election interference. And of course the government who's currently in power says, ah, wasn't that big of a deal. And, uh, other countries thought this was a big deal. So much of a big deal. In fact, that the U S Congress had Michael Chung come and testify in front of them over this. Wow. U S lawmakers praise MP Michael Chong's courage in calling out China meddling. Wow. Yeah. That's a title I was not expecting. Right. So American politicians showered a Canadian colleague with praise as conservative MP Michael Chong told his personal stories Tuesday in Washington. At a Capitol Hill hearing on China's foreign interference, the interference, the MP was invited to testify about his firsthand experience as the target of an alleged political campaign by China. It's not easy to stand up for freedom. It takes a lot of courage, one Republican congressman, Ryan Zink, told him. A Republican Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska said, I just want to let you know how much we admire and appreciate it. It was a rare cross-border political phenomenon with a sitting member of one parliament Canada's testifying before legislatures in another country. Wow. Like the other part too, I had to laugh. Like they of course the Republican had to throw freedom into the yeah. sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Republican. But I just thought that was funny, but just wow. The fact that he actually um, called out China, like, that was not what I was expecting at all. Because mm-hmm. um, I know that when it first came to light here in Canada, everybody was like, oh, he needs to step down. And there were calls for action and nothing really came of it. So it was just like, oh, this feels like another Trudeau sweeping under the rug kind of job. But this is interesting. This is wild. I think the one you're actually talking about is as a, a different type of a different MP who got pressured as well. He was a liberal MP. There was a second one? Yeah, there was, there was a few that got, like, pressure put on them, both the conservative and the liberal party. Oh, man. That's... Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fact no. check that really quick here, but... Yeah. Dan, Han, Han Dong, that's who it was. Yeah. So, the liberal, so, yeah, so the conservative guy came forward about the pressure that China was putting on him. Han Dong was the one guy who was like, it wasn't a big deal. Liberal tried, liberals tried to sweep it on the rug, you know? Yeah. And meanwhile, yeah, he was the... Uh, Part of the party that was in power when this all went down. That's, oh my God, how many, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's a lot of the problem people are having, right? Like obviously the term racism or any type of ism gets thrown around when these conversations come up where it's like, we want to know of who of Chinese descent is getting pressured by the Chinese communist party. We want to know, Oh, that's racist. <laughs> no, like this is real. We have an opportunity of freedom for now here in this country uh, where people are able to come grow their families, do their things. They end up becoming Canadians, which is awesome. The fact that we have that opportunity is amazing, but these people have family back in China underneath a a communist government. And they're going to use if the, if you know, the extension of that family gets into politics in another country, they're going to put pressure on the family that's still in China to make sure that they can, get their hands in what's going on in other political processes in the world so they can be the next world power. That's just how things work. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I'm actually really psyched to see that, you know, MP uh, Michael Chong came forward and talked about it in U S Congress of like what happened to him, what happened with his family, the type of pressure they're putting on his family. And I think more of this needs to happen so that we can stop China's meddling in our election processes. Yeah. Period. The problem is, is like if you get a government power, that the meddling supported like what we saw it's it's going to be the same thing it's just going to be like oh it's not a big deal don't worry about it you know we don't have to look too closely at that yeah p.s write about something else you know (laughs) (laughs) we don't need to think about uh like see this is what i I find annoying is because i was like i didn't didn't follow the story at all didn't hear about the story didn't know nothing about it but yet the fact that like 
everybody in this country right now seems to be in uproar about um, the trans rights issues and and whatever that has to do with um, lawmakers in each province and school rules and all that stuff. It's just like, that's what I'm hearing all about. And it's just really annoying because I'm like, that's, you know, trans people make up 0.2% of the Canadian population. Like this is a lawmaker. This is, I think you need to even rephrase that. What's that? Is it zero point? I thought you said it was zero point zero two. No, it's zero point zero point two. Yeah, gotcha. So, and it's just like, and then we have federal, like bureaucrats, or sorry, not bureaucrats, federal MPs being influenced and their families influenced by foreign powers. <laughs> it's like, why is that not front page news? <laughs> like, why is that not in my face? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and this is unprecedented. Like, I don't know if and if if when the last time an MP. Or someone from like who was in politics in Canada had to sit in front of Congress to testify in the U.S. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I've I've never heard of it, and I think that's why they said like this is the first time it's happened. I mean, we have sent Chrissy Freeland to go down and give really sad speeches at Fenway Park. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but uh, but yeah, never this. So this is huge. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's I thought that was worth talking about just because. Look at look it up on your own. MP Michael Chong to appear before U.S. Congress, whatever it is, take a look. It's it's a very interesting story, and to see him kind of come forward and talk about it, I think is important, uh, so that we can start taking action against a country that's essentially trying to subvert the superpower uh, and Western interests at this point. Mm-hmm. You can view that however you want to view that. Is the U.S. the evil empire? Maybe. But it's the evil empire that you've been benefiting from. <laughs> so <laughs> you tell me whatever you're going to support. Yeah. Or if you don't want to support, that's totally fine too. But it's definitely a, a story that you you should take a look into. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I look at it and I'm like, you've got China feels like an evil empire. U.S. is definitely a bit of an evil empire. It's like the friend of my enemy is my friend or the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> so, and I think the other part of it too, is if we have so much family and, you know, cross cultural connection with the U S that like, even though they've done some heinous things, it's like, well, you know, that's just, you know, uncle America over there doing something not so great, but uh, you know, at least it's not, our crazy neighbor China over there. <laughs> so guess we're going to deal with it. Well, we have a bit of a clash of values. Yeah. Say uh, communism versus democracy. Mm. Interesting conversation there to be had. Um, but uh, Guy Beau, your boy, mm-hmm. environment minister, snapped at a report the other day, dude. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why this is an interesting story, because this is, part and parcel expected by this current liberal government. They know their days are numbered. They know time's come. They're, they're going to be out of power and they're snapping. Anytime someone points out the truth, anyone points out, even has a question, they're losing their minds. And I thought this was an interesting interview. You mentioned extreme events like wildfires and hurricanes. Why has your carbon tax not stopped those things? If that is the answer to these problems. The, this is this question, which I've heard in the House of Commons by many Conservative Party members, including Pierre Polyev, is is yet another example of the fundamental disbelief that you have in climate science and in science full stop. Um, we won't solve climate change overnight, and we certainly won't solve climate change with, with, with empty slogans. It's going to take years of hard work to tackle this environmental crisis. And the fact that, that you believe that somehow we can flick a switch on a wall and everything's going to be fine just shows how to, the, the total ignorance that, that you and many others have when it comes to the issue of climate change. The total ignorance. <laughs> hey, take it easy. English is a second language, yeah. all right? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't count. You're a, you're a minister. You should be fluent in both languages. Oh, and, calling and them good. out. <laughs> calling them out. <laughs> but uh, this just drives me up the freaking wall because he's just like, oh, yeah, you don't believe in science and blah, 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 blah. Didn't talk anything about the carbon tax, because as I've said on this many times, as the provincial, or sorry, not the provincial, the federal um, budget officer pointed out, like carbon taxes aren't a good way to deal with climate change, aren't a good way to deal with any kind of environmental problems. 
Like whether you believe in climate change or you don't believe in climate change, the fact that, you know, we have issues in our climate where when a pipe bursts and you flood half of the country with oil and then have to deal with that cleanup, it's like, yeah, there'd be nice if we actually use some of that carbon tax money to maybe safeguard some of these systems and make things a little greener and make things a little bit better, reduce pollution inside of cities so that people aren't getting respiratory illnesses. Like there's so many things that you can do to actually make things better in the environment. And I feel like even if they are collecting the carbon tax to do that kind of work, they're not <laughs> like, they're just not <laughs> like they're doing the worst version of a carbon tax. You could possibly do. They tax you and do nothing with it. And except for line their pockets and send it overseas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's like, that's the part that annoys the crap out of me. Cause I'm just like, there's so many things you could do. Like I thought about even doing like a TikTok just on like, um, just something simple, like extended, um, producer responsibility. So EPR. And what that means is like when you have a product coming from a producer, that the product either can be fixed um, or it can be recycled easily. So meaning that like all the pieces and the components in it can just be taken apart. It's, just, it's not something that's like plastic lined onto cardboard that's melted into a piece of glass. Like, you know what I mean? Like things that are actually easy to, to separate. And so it makes it easy to recycle or using um, different types of plastic alloys that are easy to recycle versus like, something that's a thin film that you know would be useless basically just good for an incinerator or a dump and so these are kind of things that you can legislate and make sweeping changes and actual real difference when it comes to our waste and the things we we produce and they don't do any of that because why because that would make it expensive <laughs> and, and it doesn't bring in revenue for them right so it would save municipalities quite a bit actually in their um, waste disposal systems because you've shifted the responsibility of waste from the municipality onto the producer again. The only problem in this is that when you see that cost savings, the municipality should reduce the tax burden on the people to make up for that savings because you know that the producer is probably going to tack that onto the price. But that never happens. <laughs> Because the municipality goes, oh, sweet, a surplus now. <laughs> and then they proceed to raise the taxes next year. So it's just, it's frustrating seeing some of these things happen. But at least in that scenario, you would actually see something. If it's going to cost you and it's going to hurt, at least it'd actually be doing something versus this carbon tax that is doing absolutely nothing but hurting. I'll give you $5,000 towards an electric vehicle. I'll give you that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> And they'll, they'll give you, a, a, what, I forget how much it was, towards heat pumps. So I recently looked at heat pumps for our place. And uh, there's a program on. And we uh, don't really have the wall space for a wall-mounted ductless heat pump. So we're like, okay, that's okay. We'll just put it outside and run ductwork through the basement and into the main rooms. And when we talked to the, the people about it, they're like, um, we're sorry, that doesn't qualify. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, it has to be the ductless wall mount. I'm like, why? It's still a heat pump. Like, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, no, um, it just won't work. We we need you to we need you to buy a a ductless one to in order to qualify for the rebate. Is this like, efficiency Nova Scotia? Um, no, efficiency Nova Scotia was great. Mm -hmm. It was actually the um. Oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. It was a private company that was going uh. to do the, the work. They were like, you're not going to get the rebate unless you actually do the ductless one. They said, because it's clear as black and white in there in the, the, the rebate language. And they said, we have installed them before for clients and they have not gotten the rebate and have been very angry with us. So just a heads up. Yeah. Just a heads up. If you're looking at heat pumps for your home. <laughs> <laughs> same yeah. thing happened to me uh i that's on my um, our first home uh, we installed a uh a ducted heat pump same issue didn't get the rebate for it even though we moved from oil yeah to this no 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 rebates here it, it is really interesting how, how they kind of make up these rules for what is what qualifies what doesn't uh and it, it's just simply the amount of electricity it uses is the reasoning yeah and the other thing to, uh, too because i was looking at um the fact that we have oil-based hot water and i was like okay we're going to need to buy an electric hot water heater and i was like 
is there any kind of rebate for that or any kind of program for that? And they're like, nope. <laughs> cool. So right now I'm still burning oil, which like sucks. Um, luckily our home is like well insulated, so we don't burn very much oil, um, even with like all the hot water and everything. But, and also it's summertime, so we're not going to be burning that much oil anyway. But uh, yeah, just the fact that it's like, if you truly wanted to move people from oil, you would think you'd make it as easy as possible to access rebates and to move people from oil. But that's, it's theater. No, they're doing that though, dude. Oh yeah? Yeah. Like they, uh, they said, you know what? No rebates. We'll use a stick instead. Yeah. And we'll jack up the price on oil. Exactly. And then you have to move. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Right? Yep. That's how we roll out here. It's uh and I'll admit, yeah, like efficiency Nova Scotia has always been a joy to work with personally. I've never had any issues with them. Me either. They're, they're probably like I I do admit, as someone who hates government programs, um, they're one of the government programs that's probably one of the most well run. Yeah. Uh, they, they actually have like a clear mandate and they're clear in their deliverables and that's something I do appreciate about, appreciate about them. Yeah, so I actually ended up working with Efficiency Nova Scotia and Clean Nova Scotia to like do the home assessment and to get rid of like an old freezer and like do a whole bunch of different things like when we first moved in um, just to figure out like what our energy needs would be. And both organizations, well run, um, actually efficient as the name implies. And so, yeah, I have to say like nothing but gold stars for those folks, but they just can't help the fact that the federal government puts stupid, you know, rules out for how they're actually going to dole re- rebates. So yeah. Welcome to the system, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I had a friend reach out after last week's episode and they heard about, you know, us, you know, getting that, uh, adopting that apple tree and, you know, how we took some of the apples and then, you know, donate some of them to the Dartmouth community fridge and, uh, and all, they're cracking jokes. He's like, Oh, you dirty conservative. You just realize you redistributed wealth. Don't you? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, and this is the problem with putting people on boxes. You don't actually know what my politics actually are, aside from what you think I believe in. Mm-hmm. The difference with this one is I wasn't stolen from, and then it was redistributed. I redistributed what my wealth was and how I wanted to see it done. I do believe in donating, giving away of my resources when I have need surplus. or surplus, I should say. Yeah. And no problem with it, but it's my discretion not being stolen from on a continual basis and it being wasted away in parts of the country or other parts of the world. Mm. You mean you want autonomy in your own finance and decisions? What? Oh, dude, who wants that, bro? <laughs> I, I want you to think for me. I'm tired of these, these days, dude. Yeah. Well, I mean, the list continues, right? So <laughs> well, the list does continue. Um, you know what? We're going to do this anyways. We didn't get a chance to really do any much research into this current TikTok, but we'll still share the TikTok and then we'll still talk about what kind of what we're seeing on the surface level and uh, where where we see things going here. Yeah. I mean, why not? We were already in that, that vein of topic, right? Exactly. Well, and again, to give you an idea this TikTok is about essentially that the carbon tax isn't adding to inflation. This person's argument who tends to be a little more left leaning is arguing for that we need a have the carbon tax and b that's not adding to us uh, the inflation issues that we're having send this video to anybody in your life who thinks that the carbon tax is the reason that inflation is occurring in canada you know that global inflation that's occurring only in canada but also all over the entire world and is somehow less in canada than it is in most countries trudeau caused that you know and economic analysis has shown that the impact of the carbon tax is incredibly small year over year it can be considered to be approximately 0.15 percentage points of inflation increases that means that in the average year it accounts for 1 20th of price increases and when inflation peaked to 8 percent last year it would have accounted for 1 54th of it so not much and that's especially because most canadians especially those who drive fuel efficient vehicles will receive larger rebate checks and they will be spending on the carbon tax and even when that economic analysis is extended to all other products that are affected by the carbon tax in ontario the direct and indirect effects inflate prices by 0.207 percent and in alberta it's 0.1875 percent so really still not that much because the carbon tax is not causing global inflation but do you want to know what is one of the largest drivers of inflation in canada it's stock buybacks and corporate profits our telecoms and our grocery companies are making record year-over-year profits every single quarter telling us that it's not their fault they're just matching inflation 
while they jack up prices by 20, 30, 40, 50 plus percent, sometimes even doubling the cost of certain products like pasta. The carbon tax is not causing inflation. Corporate greed is. So I have two things there. Yeah, hit me. Yeah, like yes and no. I, I totally I totally agree with that sentiment. It's like corporate greed is driving inflation. I mean, we've heard like the recorded phone calls between uh, grocery CEOs when they're like talking about uh, how much can they increase. They're like, you know, it's not whether or not we are going to increase things or not going to increase. It's just like how much the, can the consumer bear? Mm-hmm. And so we know that that's definitely true. Um, but speaking as somebody who drives a gas, you know, vehicle, it's like, no, I'm still feeling that. And also when he talks about the economists that are quoting this, he's directly referring to the Bank of Canada report um, that came out saying that um, the carbon tax wasn't directly causing inflation. And so like, I get what he's saying exactly about like, you know, things are going up all around the world and like hearing about different housing crises in Australia, in New Zealand, in um, Great Britain, like all these, these very Western countries that are, you know, basically cousins of us. Um, so yeah, I get it and I get what he's saying, but at the same time, adding a carbon tax on top of it isn't helping anything (laughs) and it is hurting people. And if you are a person who lives rurally and you have to drive every single day, like, yeah, it is going to hurt. And maybe it's not hurting as much in Ontario where you have the TTC and you have go trains and you have all kinds of other options. Um, but it is hurting Nova Scotians where most of us have to drive to our jobs. We don't have the same kind of infrastructure. So to then look at Ontario and say, well, this is the same for the rest of the country. Like that to me is just false. It's not um, nuanced enough. And the other thing I think about that too is just, it hasn't been in place long enough to actually truly understand what's happening. Um, because I also listened to a couple different TikToks from farmers who were talking about the the actual like costs that it's causing um, to their farm operations and how much money it's it's taking away from their profitability and their ability to to remain solvent. And so I look at all that and then I'm like, okay, well that is going to drive up prices or it's actually going to create a bigger divide between um, small suppliers and large suppliers where large suppliers can absorb these kind of um, fluctuations and small suppliers can't and they go out of business and then we're just left with massive corporate farms. So I, I look at this kind of stuff and I'm like, we don't even know the impacts fully yet. It hasn't even been that long. Like Nova Scotia only had its carbon tax slapped on us like for the past couple of months. You can't make a sweeping statement like the carbon tax isn't affecting us until you actually give it some time to see, well, how did it actually affect us? What were the unintended consequences that we didn't know about? What were the, they, they call them black swans, things we don't know that we don't know that then we find out later. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, I don't, don't subscribe to that at all. Oh, that was the most Canadian response I heard in my life. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're an idiot. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, I, th- I do think you make some good points. Depending on where you are in the country, uh, at least when it comes to your gas and stuff you're putting into your car, you know, the carbon tax is making up close to 5 to 8% of your your, your gas bill, mm-hmm. typically, depending on where you are in the country. And you just, again, you compound that over transportation, over what's be used again, on farms, um, what's used to run grocery stores. Um, like there's just, you have to look at the supply chain as a whole and where the compound effect happens. And again, I agree. Um, after having an, n- enough conversations with people who are involved in the grocery industry, yeah, it is both. There is an ac- inadequacy uh, in politics and political decisions with the carbon tax. And there's CEOs who are being greedy and just trying to see how much they can drive up prices before people revolt. Yeah. People do their thing. Um, and so in the middle of that is the regular people who are just getting smoked on le- the left side. It's your politicians. And on the right side, it's your, the CEOs, of these companies you're trying to buy from. Yeah. And you're getting smoked regardless. And so now you're getting slapped with like, like a, a compounded version of inflation. Uh, yep. Yeah, is there global inflation? Yes. 
we can talk about what's causing global inflation. Uh, we can talk about what happened with Russia uh, starting in April of 2021, 2022, whatever it was. And, you know, that leading to a lack of wheat being sent out and that causing some issues. And power disruptions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so through that, you have all these issues. Again, these compound problems that continue. And our governments just aren't doing a great job with handling the issues that are coming their way. And instead of trying to kind of make it a little easier, try to cushion the blow that we're feeling, they're adding to it and yeah. making it worse. So I agree. It is both. And we need uh, accountability on both. And you have, you know, Trudeau saying, oh, I want to tax these grocery stores more <laughs> if you don't start making moves. That's the best speech I've heard. Like that was the most Trudeau speech ever. If you, we don't see any significant change with grocery store prices, then we, there's nothing that's off the table, even taxes. I'm like, great. Thanks, Trudeau. What you do best, giving a taxes. tangible, <laughs> gi- giving a tangible result for how they're going to achieve this. Like there's not even like, you didn't even give like a number of what you're trying to get to. Just, if we don't see, if we don't see significant changes, then we'll untax you. I'm like, bro. There's got to be some action action points on that. Come on. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? And like my evaluation brain now, <laughs> after absorbing a week of content um, and getting that refresher, it's just crying. It's weeping right now. It's like none of, uh, none of that, like you said, is actionable. Um, there's nothing there that is actually accountable even. It's like they could lower the price on no-name products by 20 cents and be like, look, we made it easier. And the turtle will be like, oh my God, yes, yes. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's such a bogus statement, right? And you already just said that, but I just echo it entirely. Just useless, useless words. And then the worst part of the whole statement is, you know, we're going to tax them. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to put a tax on them. And it's like, great. So we can absorb that tax as well wonderful so and you know what they're gonna say they're gonna say you know we're sorry we can't help it uh this is what we had to do because the federal government and it's just gonna be finger pointing again it's just gonna be trudeau versus another conglomerate you know trudeau versus the media now it's trudeau versus (laughs) versus the grocery stores it's like oh my god get him out (laughs) remove him (laughs) it's a bloodbath out here (laughs) send this guy home please Yeah. yeah well one thing I found interesting is I'm starting to see the CBC, CTV, Global Mail already made the shift earlier, um, but mainly CBC and T- CTV. Um, they've been having some interesting features in mm. moments on their programming where they're starting to attack the liberals now. I know. And I'm like, oh, it looks like they see the writing on the wall, what's coming. And now they're trying to change their tune a little bit because they know that their boss is getting put out of power fairly soon. And it's funny because, like, looking at the conservative mandates, like, they have very clearly said they're going to defund the CBC. Um, So it's not in the CBC's interest. So you know that when you're seeing articles that are, you know, anti-liberal, it must be bad. (laughs) When you're actively working against your own interests, you know that it's it's bad because uh, that means the reporters, the people on the ground, um, the little people, if you will, the people like us, are actually hurting that much that they're just like, nah, this is a story that's going out there. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the editors are doing to it to try and soften the blow as it goes out the door. But I'd be surprised if it wasn't, you know, a lot harsher and then and made softer for the Canadian palette. (laughs) Why why do you think they're changing their tone, their tune? What do you, why do I think, uh, why do I think that's happening? Yeah. Uh, like I said, just to make it, more palatable because they are the people that write the checks, right? So you don't want to, you want to push enough that you look unbiased and you want to look um, not completely bought and paid for, but you don't want to be too flamboyant that uh, you ruffle feathers and, and bite the hand that feeds you. Totally. I guess more so what I was getting at is why they're starting to put out stories that seem a little more unbiased and seem like they're going both sides now. And a part of me, is because, you know, as I said, they see the writing on the wall that they know that they can't write stories that are just going after one side because they know that check isn't going to come fairly soon. 
So now this is my just my theory is that they're starting to change their tune so that people like us will pay their will actually pay for their content. We'll pay for what they're putting out because we actually start believing and trusting they're actually performing legitimate journalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what we're going to start seeing too is this pushback of actually trying to actually share real stories that are happening. Yeah. Well, whatever it means, if I'm getting something that's less bias, I think I'm going to celebrate that for what it is because I'm just so sick of seeing things so slanted that it just like makes you nauseous reading it. <laughs> like there was one, um, I forget exactly the, the article's content, but it was basically comparing Trudeau and Polyev. And at the very beginning, it was just like, Polyev makes statements based on classic conservative rhetoric. And then like wrote the little piece about it. And then they're like, Trudeau leaning into the science. And it was like, of course you wrote it that way. Like making it look like you've got somebody who's just an old fogey, just, you know, we're doing it this way because it's always been done this way. And then you've got somebody who's like nuanced and who's like out there reading the journals and coming up with their own thought and, you know, making sure that it's something that is tried and tested and, and proven <laughs> and data driven. That was the other part there, like data driven scientific. And it was just like, wow, you hit all the buzzwords for that one. <laughs> like it was, it was so much that I was like, why didn't they throw synergy in there? I mean, <laughs> you got to get vibrant. <laughs> you got to get all the words. <laughs> totally. Well, that, I mean, I, I do see the, our, our social media feed economy, I think has really caused a lot of the issue and divide that we're seeing. Um, because as you said, yeah, the only reason I'm bringing this up because you, you mentioned a word there that reminded me of this and that was buzzwords, keywords, mm -hmm. SEO yep. are big things, right? And so why do, why has this become such a meme of, you know, he called me a sexist, racist, bigot, you know, homophobic conservative. Well, it started off back in the day where it was like, well, so-and-so made racist comments about so-and-so. And then it became about, oh, I saw how much that word's coming up in the SEO results. What if I add sexist and racist? Oh, I get an even bigger result. And this is actually what has led to a lot of the just kind of one upping and because it improves, you know, the buzz feeds of the world, the vices of the world, these types of news companies, this is kind of the content they'd put out because it would get so many clicks that they kept trying to add as many buzzwords and or into their articles as possible to get as many people bouncing to their site as they or getting to their site as possible. And I think that's my theory is partially why we were seeing such a huge, crazy divisive rhetoric when people see injustices that they at least they perceive to be injustices. Yeah. Cause it uh, looks better on the web page. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Makes you the first result on Zoo on Google and that's what's going to pay. Right. Totally. So well, that's what gets you that ad revenue. Exactly. And that's, what's more so concerning. And I mean, we've talked about this on the show before, but like we're at this point where, you know, Polyev himself will use him where he's been called, you know, he's made transphobic statements or homophobic statements or racist comments. Um, and you're at the point where people are so disillusioned and just so like those words are just ignored now that there's like, Oh, if they're calling him that, then he must be doing something right. Like that's where people are going in their reasoning at this point. Because we've seen so many lies put out in the media about people um, who the the machine had an axe to grind with. Yeah. And that's the thing I always, I admit, I'm happy Pierre did it, but I knew it was going to take a lot of the guts to pull it off. But when he's told before he started running, he's like, I would defend the CV, defund the CBC. And people said, you sure you want to do that? Because like your previous conservative leaders like really needed, you know, the CBC to be able to get elected. And he's like, well, they're going to come after me anyways. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and play nice with them. Yep. I'm just going to tell them exactly what I'm planning to do. And that's where we are. And it's funny because like when he first said that, I was like, mm, this is not, this is not winning my heart and mind. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because I remember sitting down at the dinner table with my, my parents and, and talking to them when I was visiting. And I was just like, did you hear that he wants to defund the CBC? Isn't that ridiculous? And then, my dad was kind of like, yeah, well, but you know, CBC is kind of like the liberal, you know, mouthpiece. And I was like, yeah, but it just 
like we need to have some kind of national unbiased um, news source and he was just like well that's not cbc and then we like had it out for a little bit about that and then of course like i go back later and i'm like reading all the different things and kind of like looking at it in a little bit of a different light trying to see where he was coming from and then i went ah oh, crap now i have to go <laughs> back and be like yeah dad you're right <laughs> <laughs> look at you go dog yeah <laughs> that's called humility yeah uh, no. <laughs> which a lot of people don't have these days <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'll eat crow when I deserve it. So I'll take my speeding ticket when I've been speeding. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play, man. Yeah, I totally get it. I do want to kind of get into this story, though. Um, it's been coming up a little bit on TikTok, but Peel Regional School Board making headlines, which is a school board that makes up a part of Ontario. So Mississauga, Brampton, Milton, kind of that western side of the GTA. Uh, and... Apparently they're starting to ban some books. Or mm-hmm. rid, I wouldn't say ban, but they're re- getting rid of books. This is this is the C- CBC article. Deselecting. You know? Oh, the deselecting, <laughs> deselecting. Empty shelves with absolutely no books. Students, parents question school board's library weeding process. Oh, weeding. We got that garden metaphor in oh, there. Oh, baby, that's, that's lovely. We yeah. love weeding. Harry Potter. What? The Hunger Games. What? And roll of thunder, hear me cry. What? Those are all examples of books. Raina Takata says she can no longer find her public high school library in Mississauga, Ontario, which she visits on her lunch hour most days. What? Harry Potter, The Hunger Game. What? What? <laughs> those gotta go. Why those? Because <laughs> J.K. Rowling, she's a problem. Hunger Games, too violent. And the other, I actually don't know what roll my, th- roll, I don't know what roll my th- roll of thunder or he may hear my cry is. But. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the leaves either. But obviously, they weren't bestsellers. <laughs> yeah, seriously, but they had to go. Yeah, womp womp. <laughs> Takata says the shelves at Arendale Secondary School were full of books, but she noticed that they had gradually started to disappear when she returned to school this fall. Things were more stark, she said. This year, I came into my school library and there are rows and rows of empty shelves with absolutely no books. Said Takata, who started grade ten last week. She estimates more than 50% of her school's library books are gone. In the spring, Takata says students were told by staff that if shelves look emptier right now, it's because we had to have to remove all books published prior to 2008. They're told this by the school staff. Interesting. Well, didn't you know that uh, those books caused the housing financial crisis back in 2008? Oh, yeah, they got to go. (laughs) They got to go. Anything that led to that crisis, you know. We don't want a second one. <laughs> Gee, true. It gets more interesting. Takata is one of several Peel District School Board students, parents, and community members CBC Toronto spoke to who are concerned about a seemingly inconsistent approach to a new equity-based book weeding process implemented by the board last spring in response to a provincial directive from the Minister of Education. They say the new process intended to ensure library books are inclusive appears to have led some schools to remove thousands of books solely because they were published in 2008 or earlier. Parents and students are looking for answers as to why this has happened and what the board plans to do moving forward. So, To Kill a Mockingbird, gone. Diary, Diary of Anne Frank, gone. Lisa, look that one up. I like that's my personal favorite. It's a little niche. Oh, okay. Gone. <laughs> it's another World War II book. Okay. I was thinking about like The Outsiders. Did you read that one? I actually never got a chance to read that one. Okay. Yeah. That one would be gone. Gone. Let's just keep the list going of classic books that are gone just because they were published pre-2008. pre What happens to all of Shakespeare? Like, <laughs> what do you do with all that? <laughs> Dude, he was white. Gone. <laughs> but I mean, it, there are claims that he was in the community, like the LGBTQ plus community. So maybe he might be saved. Oh, so true. Yeah. Equity and diversity. He might be a part of the, that crew. You might be right. But he was before 2008, so... Might be gone. Gone. <laughs> Take him. <laughs> Take him. Um, this one, honestly, for me, kind of hit a little weird. Only because I kind of had that moment of like, am I getting old? When they said anything prior to 2008, I was like, I was in high school. I was, I was in the 11th grade yeah. at that time. Anything that I kind of grew up on and learned, gone. Things I learned about in history with regards to World War II, World War I, um, the Ottoman Empire, the Bolsheviks in Russia, like, or the Soviet Union at the time, like all these different stories and books are just poof gone because of an equity diversity quota or or initiative they're trying to 
action on. I just, I don't understand what that means. Um, like that's, that's the problem that I have. It's like, because like, why wouldn't you, if this was like the process that you want to go through of like actually creating more equity and diversity, why wouldn't you just buy more, you know, brown, black, indigenous authors and just add them to the library? Like I, I always, I never understood that. Like, why wouldn't you just, you know, even out the authors by just stacking the shelves with books that are made by diverse voices? Like why, why this? Because you get exactly what's happening right now where people are just like, this is stupid. <laughs> because like you could very easily say like, okay, like most of the books in this room were made by white men. Like, cool. There's other stories out there that we can find. Cool. Find them, put them on the shelves. Cool. Everybody wins. You get like more diverse authors in your library and people have the freedom to read what they want to read, whether that be the Harry Potter or whether that be, you know, some other book. Like I'm, I'm thinking of like, uh, like silent spring or, um, like an, I don't know. I don't know more manifesto. Is it reconciliation manifesto like indigenous authors? Why not just put them in there? People want to read them they'll read them don't take books off the shelves like that's just like i was saying before we even began we we're like 1985 like 84 that's it 1984 is it 84 oh crap it's all good it's all good yeah. you're liberal i understand oh okay thanks <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um yeah it's these are the equivalent of book burnings let's take these off yeah. the shelves do not allow our youth to learn about our rich history of literature we've seen this in different communist governments across history. This is where it starts. It's all about diversity and inclusion. But like it's this is how you go in terms of just dictating what people can learn, dictating what people information people have available to them. And this is the stuff this type of stuff is why you're seeing homeschooling on the rise mm -hmm. in this country because more of this is starting to happen. I had a story the other day, which is more of a funnier on the lighter side, but this is the type of stuff people like, you know, uh, are kind of annoyed by. But there was, I was talking to a parent who was sitting in on a class, a math class with their, their child. And there was kind of a parent volunteer. So there's kind of there cutting things up, whatever. And then the teacher's just writing things on the board. And it was just like maybe like a three line kind of paragraph they're writing about. This teacher had three spelling mistakes in just three lines on a chalkboard. And she's like, bro, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, bro, like, three spelling mistakes. Uh, privilege was one of the words, you know, that was misspelled. So oh. I understand that one can be a little tricky at times. Um, but it was just like very kind of like, really? Like, those are the words that you, you messed up. You messed up. Convenience always gets me yeah. every time. It's not oh, a convenient, convenient word <laughs> sure. to spell. <laughs> but it's just stuff like that. Or this is the type of stuff where people who are pro homeschooling are just like, these are the people are teaching our kids. They can't even spell, you know? And then you add stuff like this a little more serious on top of that, where they're just getting rid of books, period. And some of the argument behind it is like, well, people are doing less reading, physical reading. So we're just trying to make more space for like, computers or other digital things in the library is another argument they're hiding behind on this one too but but this one they're not even hiding, they're just hiding behind gender and or is they a diversity and inclusion yeah like if you scroll up like the shelves are just empty like yeah. there's no they're not like combining them you don't see one full shelf and then a bunch of computers in there now like <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're just <laughs> sure there's just empty <laughs> so i mean it's public education they'll get there you know yeah it's like when I walked down the aisle for storm chips the other day before the hurricane, it looked like that. All that was left was the lays. <laughs> I was like, I don't want those. <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah, so this is kind of where things are getting at into our country, um, or I'd say at least this is a part of Ontario. Uh, and, it's, and Peel District is, is a fairly large school board, mm -hmm. and that thing's no joke. So to see this happening in that school board is should be of concern and make sure you're checking in on your kids education and schooling what's happening within the schools and seeing if they're trying to do stuff like this and I wouldn't you know don't go with the all guns blazing like some have but <laughs> just ask questions see what's going on poke your head in be be engaged with your children's education I think that's really important uh, I'm 
I totally see the benefit of homeschooling if you can do it properly. But if you can't, I also would implore you to, as you should be, as any parent should be, be engaged with your kids first off. Understand what they're going through and what they're learning. And if they're doing stuff like this at your school, A, talk, ask questions about it. But also maybe go over that literature at home. Maybe you teach them something instead of relying on the system to raise your kids too. So. I, I just have so many mixed feelings about all that. Like, I'm just thinking about all the people that I knew that were homeschooled and like their social skills were definitely um, not as developed just by pure virtue of not actually interacting with different people all the time. So I think that there's so much value in interacting with different people, just the same way as having a library with different books means you get to interact with different stories. Um, so yeah, that's where I, I feel, but I, I understand where people are wanting homeschooled um, curriculum instead of, of going in the public route. And I also think that we don't place enough value on our education system as far as like a provincial priority. Um, so, and I know that's right across the board. And so that's kind of disappointing because I do know quite a few teachers who are really good teachers who just like, they're like, we want to do anything out of the box or, you know, good for the students. It's something that we have to pay for out of our own pocket. So it makes it really challenging to do the kind of things that are going to be innovative and are going to be um, really worthwhile and, you know, effective for them. One teacher that I know in particular, like he does like all kinds of like custom artwork and stuff like that. Cause that's, that's his jam and he pays for it all out of his budget or not out of his budget, sorry, out of his own personal budget, not out of his teacher's budget. Cause the teacher budget is like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that's nothing. So, so yeah. Um, yeah. It's hard because like if I was to think about how provincial funds are allocated, like I would put more into education and less into some other things. Cause I think that you're probably going to get a higher return on investment with, you know, giving proper education to your kids than you are maybe doing other things. I mean, yeah, I think overall, I think we all know the system needs a rejig period, mm -hmm. but that's inconvenient. So that'll never happen. At least not in my lifetime. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and I think it's going to, I think the only way that for it to be rejigged personally, because we're at the point of extremism in our culture. It's just going to happen. Like extreme things have to happen to be able to get attention. And I think it's going to be a swath of people pulling their kids out of the system for the system to find be like, Oh, we actually need to do something of value to be able to get these kids back into the system. I, I want, it'll take. I wonder if it's going to be less people taking kids out of the system um, to homeschool and maybe the rise of more private collegiate institutes mm. kind of like what you see with healthcare where you have like two tiered health that right. people are pushing for. I wonder if you're going to see like people push for two tiered education. Mm. You could be on something there. I've been hearing that's another thing I've been hearing people want to put their kids in private education as well. Yeah. There's a lot there to be, there's a lot to chew on there. And so I wonder if like, when you think about that, then it's like, when you start to see your public um, systems, like the pillars of our society start to crumble a little bit, people tend to, to pull out and put the money into it that way. Mm. So I wonder what that says, you know? Yeah. Like, does that mean that we would rather dictate the funds to healthcare and to education and away from other, other things? Probably. And so what does that mean when we look at our people who are actually directing funds from the public purse? Maybe they're not doing the most fiscally responsible job. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, and how do we hold them accountable to that? And so I think that's probably the precursor, the upstream of all of this. It's like, obviously fund education, fund healthcare, like make them better um, because that has better outcomes. But it's like before that, it's like, okay, how do we hold the people accountable to make sure that the funding is going where we want it? Okay. Well, you know, what does that look like then legally speaking and how do we get there? Like, does that mean like term limits based off of performance and how do we, you know, measure things? How do we evaluate things? So it's just like, I feel like there's so much foundational work that has to happen. And I think that that's where we need to 
put attention to. And, and basically, when you see organizations like uh, the Center for Policy Alternatives, or I'm trying to think of the other one, um, Canadian Taxpayer Federation, like they're, they're non non for profits across the country that actually do thought into these types of things on how to actually make things better, how to solve some of these problems, how to at least you know, fill in the gaps a bit. Um, and so I think that that's where we need to be looking to and, and getting direction from is some of these people who do this on the regular just for the sake of wanting to make things better. Totally. I think one fun random fact, just because we're talking on the topic of taxes and stuff, is, and this is something people know, I'm sure many people know, but when I tell this to my American friends, they, they're A, their jaws drop and they start, they freak out. And that is how Canada deals with lottery winnings. <laughs> the most hilarious thing to explain to an American. Yeah. Because, you you know, you, we wa- I was watching some with Kelsey one day and one of those game shows or whatever and they were going to win like $2 million. I'm like, wow, could you imagine winning $2 million? That'd be interesting. And she's like, yeah, I mean, you'll see like half of it. I'm like, <laughs> not in Canada, baby. You'll see the whole thing. She's like, what do you mean? He's like, we don't tax lottery winnings here in Canada. And she said, what? This country taxes everything. If they could tax you to breathe, they would. How are they not taxing lottery wings? That's crazy. I was like, shh, stay quiet. At least we got something. <laughs> you know, but that is really interesting to me that we've picked a lottery winnings of everything to not tax at all. But oh, don't worry. My big thing is like mega churches who also collect money and pay their staff massive salaries that are all just you know it's all charitable so <laughs> true and <laughs> there's no tax on that <laughs> they're pulling their private jets on and everything too yeah golden toilets <laughs> dude straight up yeah that's really interesting gee all right let's hop to the end here yep um this is an important story uh as taiwan urges china to stop military activities happening in the region mm-hmm. so we're looking at reuters here and uh Taiwan urges China to stop destructive military activities. So China, which views democratically democratically governed Taiwan as its own territory, has in recent years regularly carried out military drills around the island as it seeks to assert its sovereignty claims and pressure Taipei. The ministry said that since Sunday, it had spotted 103 Chinese military aircraft over the sea, a number it called a recent high. Its map of Chinese activities over the last 24 hours showed fighter jets crossing the median line of the Taiwan Strait which had served as an unofficial barrier between the two sides until China began regularly crossing it a year ago. Other aircraft flew south of Taiwan through the ba- um, Bashi Channel, which separates the island from the Philippines. So China's encroaching and moving in on Taiwan. Uh, we've talked we talked about this initially on the show over a year ago at this point of the West. By the West, we mean the States and then whatever the rest of NATO is going to be fighting two wars. We're going to be fighting Russia on one side and China on the other. Welcome to the party, pal. Woohoo. <laughs> Gee. You know what we need to do? We need to send a strong female leader to Taiwan <laughs> and make sure that uh, she can you know, talk to the people there and, and give them hope. I mean, the states already did, it, so we should probably send Chrissy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're not wrong, not wrong on that one. Uh, but this is like we're officially at the escalation point, right? Like this has been happening over the past year and a half, where more and more is happening, and with the discombobulation of politics in the states and in Canada, China putting pressure. We talked about at the beginning of the show on our political leaders in our election processes, um, the way that China is putting essentially bought off a lot of the private uh, investments in the states and start extracting value out of the states and moving it to China. This is where we're at. You can, we can have this debate, but there's a reason why when Trump came in in 2016, he was labeled as a racist for wanting to bring the jobs back home away from China back to America because it didn't serve the private interests at the time. So they tried to really just, he made it easy, as some of the things he was saying, but that's what they weren't just calling him racist for, you know, because they, they had such a noble cause to fight against Trump. It was because he was going against their monetary interests as well, mm-hmm. and they couldn't have that. 
Well, it's, it's kind of like the whole thing that I'm thinking about too, with like even part of the reason why I'm doing this like living locally project is like, I actually want to know what can I get locally? Um, and what can't I get locally? If like, crap hits the fan because we have to think about the fact that our supply chains are so integrated with Asia that I mean like if crap hits the fan we're going to be hit hard because they have us over a barrel they have all of our manufacturing and all of our food like so much of like things like garlic garlic is the easiest thing to grow in the world here in Nova Scotia like I grow garlic every year um it takes no work like you literally set it and forget it let the rain and the sun hit it you're good to go. You pull it out at the end of the year, take the best ones, save them for planting again, eat the rest of it. All the garlic that you find in the grocery stores from China, all of it. <laughs> it's just like, why are we not investing in our own local supply chains? And because when I look at this stuff, like what's happening with Taiwan, I'm like, they're just one bad mistake away from, you know, the U S going, Oh, Time to time to get into this party because I feel like the U.S. is just they're looking for a fight. They're waiting for something to happen with Russia and Ukraine that's bad enough that they can justify getting in there. Um, I know that we had talked about earlier before, like there were some suspicious pipelines that uh, may have uh, accidentally imploded. We don't know what happened there, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel like the U.S. is just itching for some kind of some kind of fight. And so, but when I think about that, I just think about the fact like one, it's going to be the tragedy of like having a war. Like there's so going to be so much loss of life and so much loss of land and just the impacts of the environment and everything that can't defend itself and people included. Um, but then also just the secondary effects of like, what is that going to do to people who are already struggling, struggling with housing, already struggling to just like get by in a, a quote unquote peace time right now. Like you throw a war on top of that and now food is limited and like supply chains are disrupted. Like it's a mess. We've got to prepare. And so part of that pre preparation is actually supporting our local businesses is building those supply chains locally so that if crap hits the fan, we're not going to go hungry mm -hmm. because we already have the infrastructure in place. Totally. I mean, I was, uh, you know, watching a guy talk about what it was like for his family to grow up, uh, in Poland at the time and the world war during world war two. And, um, and kind of, you know, suffering under a communist regime at that time. And, uh, each kind of apartment had their, um, uh, they had their own gardens, uh, and their own complexes had their own gardens. Uh, reason being is because each person was given, you know, a portion of food per week and it often was never enough to feed one person for a mm -hmm. week. So it led to these people having to create their own gardens so they could make their own food and live off that instead. Um, and if that were to happen, a version of that happening here where you, you know, you said war breaks out, supply chains are absolutely cut now. Like we're screwed. Like if you're at war with China and Russia, actively hot war. Yeah. We're not getting shipments from them anymore. No. You know, and uh, yeah, your garlic ain't coming from them no more. <laughs> um, it would screw both countries up uh, a lot and it just a lot more desperation would be created, but you make a great point. We have to find a way to be more reliant on ourselves as things have escalated to a point that I've never seen them escalate to in my lifetime. It's gonna make it's gonna make sense for it to it's I think it's gonna hit a point where we're gonna see hot war. I hope we don't. I hope it doesn't happen, but it's seeming more likely, especially as China puts more pressure on Taiwan. And I don't know what's gonna happen with this upcoming election in the States. Oh, there's so like, there's just so much right like there's I so know. much to consider that i don't know what's going to hit first and i keep seeing kamal harris come out and say things like oh you know if if something happens to biden like i i will step up to the plate of course, <laughs> and like of course you will. <laughs> actually like making these statements i'm like is something gonna happen to biden like something needs to like tell him <laughs> like, yeah, i mean he's not fully mitch mcconnelling at the podium but i mean when you've fallen down the stairs and off a bike and down a straight flat ramp like you know that many times I, know, I start to wonder like you know he is getting up there but at the same time like i said when your vice president keeps making all these statements like if if the time came that you know something was was up i'd gladly step into power and, and lead and it's like nice. 
that's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> it makes me think of like Hamlet, you know, the king's brother just swooping in. <laughs> yep. Oh, but that wouldn't be a book you would be able to read. Oh, true. Uh, yeah. That's that one. <laughs> Not in the Peel region. No. <laughs> We're getting rid of that one. There's already fights happening internally in the Democratic Party, which I think is interesting. Um, they want Biden to step down so badly. And apparently with whatever cognitive ability he has left, he's saying, no, I can go another term. Classic boomer. Yeah. <laughs> True. Get out. <laughs> You're done. And uh, and I'm like, I'm sorry, Biden. Like, you know, you, you pulled it off the first time around barely uh, in, I would say, from my perspective, was a dishonest election. Um, you barely, you still barely pulled that one off. Now that you really ticked off most of America, uh, you've lost at this point, based on polls, you've lost upwards of five to six percent of the black vote, which is what they rely upon to get power. You're done. You're done. You know, and so of course they're gonna need to get someone else in their little fresh face to be able to take on Trump, who's he's common, whether you like it or not. And people are very much in support of him. He's his approval rating or yeah, it just keeps going up of like people who are going to vote for him. It's just going to happen. So, um, I suspect, I don't actually, I would just say I suspect, but I have a, I have a feeling I could see it happening where hot war is instigated sooner before, before that election. So mm. that they have a reason to maybe push it off. Yeah. It's interesting because I think about Biden and I think about Trudeau and then I think about Trump and I think about Poliev. And I think the defining factors for me that I look at, it's like if I'm Russia or China and I'm looking at the governments of these two countries and I look at Trudeau and I look at Biden, I'd be like, they're weak. Mm -hmm. Like you got one who's very pretty and will say whatever he feels like saying half the time screwing it up. Um, and then you've got another guy who's like I said, falling over standing up so it doesn't it doesn't appear like if this is your champion you know you look at that and you're like easy um the one thing i'll say about trump and poliev is that when you listen to them speak even if what's coming out of their mouth is garbage at least they're saying it with conviction with like actual power behind it where you're just like oh these people mean business like there's a, there's a little bit of crazy there than just <laughs> enough that like, I, I gotta, I gotta watch myself. So I feel like that's kind of what people need a little bit. And so I think that if the liberals ever hope of, you know, getting somebody into power, what they need to do is they need to actually lean into that, finding that strong voice and somebody who's actually going to stand up for their liberal values, but in a way that's not performative, that's not um, disingenuous and it's not just like very flowery and, and weak. They need somebody who's actually going to embody strength um, because that's kind of what I get when I see it Poliev. Um, I don't agree with some of the things he says. Some of the things that he says, I hope that he does when he gets into power. Um, but yeah, it, at least when I look at it, I'm like, even if he doesn't do the things that he says, at least Canada's not going to look like we're just a bunch of pushovers. And I feel like that's, what we look like right now with, with Trudeau. And I feel like the States feels the same way with, with Biden. They look and they're like sleepy Joe, you know, <laughs> asleep at the helm. And so they need somebody who's going to get up there. Who's going to make noise. Who's going to be fiery. Who's going to be spicy and who's going to actually draw attention and, and let people know that they're not to be messed with. And I think that's what's, I think that's why you're going to see the elections go the way they're going to go. You make a good point about conviction. I'll ask this question. Who? In the Liberal Party, do you think it embodies conviction? Who you would like that strength? Mm. They embody strength. See, the problem is the people that I would say got kicked out by Trudeau. So exactly, yeah, I would have I would have said Jody Wilson Raybould mm -hmm. for sure. I think that she could have been the next female Prime Minister of Canada, and I would have been proud to support her. And she got kicked out. Yeah. So even Jane Philpot, who backed her up too, was just like, "No, this is wrong. What you're doing is wrong." He's like, see ya. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So for somebody who's a quote unquote feminist, you know, oh, there's two very strong, educated, well-spoken, powerful women that you just kicked out. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know who embodies that right now. Cause like I said, you kicked them out. Yeah, exactly. None of them. There is nobody in the liberal party. I would actually say has that. I think Sean Fraser's weak. I think the representative for Ajax, I'm forgetting his name. He's weak. 
Chris here, Freelance Week. Um, uh, Melanie Jolie, I don't think she's an MP, but she's still, she's weak. When you don't, as a liberal party, when you get into identity politics, and one of the identities that you uh, villainize is strength or, you know, quote unquote, traditional masculine energy, whatever you want to call that. When you alienate that out of your party, you're going to have a bunch of weak leaders. And I think that's what's happened. You have anyone who stands up to Judo was casted out. Anyone who has a strong personality cast it out. And when you're, you're a leader, is weak to get um, from the get-go. And then anyone, he just casts out anyone who's stronger than him, which is a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You're going to be left with the bottom 10% of people who are just weak. So, Well, it's, and when I think about weak, I think of, like, not physical strength. I think of that, like, being a syncophant or, like, just Mm -hmm. yes men. Yeah, exactly. No No backbone. No backbone, just going with whatever is said. Um, cause like I said, I, I really thought Jody Wilson Raybould, I was like, I was really, really impressed with her. Um, and I think that, like I said, if she would have been in power, I think you would have seen a lot more people. I think you definitely would have seen the entire indigenous vote come out and, and fully support, um, because she probably would have did something yeah. <laughs> instead of talking about clean drinking water on reserves, she probably actually would have brought it. But, um, yeah, exactly what you said. Like, he he's completely created a, a group of yes people around him and and that's that's what you get <laughs> dude well and, today was their first day back in question period and uh seeing everyone stand up and and give him a standing o to start off oh, I cracked know. me up i was like what a <laughs> bunch of losers oh my gosh all right well that's the end of that let's hit our wild card segment and the sucker off dude the difference between men and women one of those hilarious TikToks oh, I, I came those. across this week, yeah. dude. I'm all about like those like personality types, and it's it's basically like I don't know what are the what are the astrological signs for yeah. like what year were you born under what moon <laughs> whatever like Mercury's in the microwave or whatever. So like that kind of stuff, I kind of look at uh, personality politics and all that in the same kind of light, and it just brings me joy. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, this one cracked me up because it was essentially the difference. Uh, it was a video about the difference between how men get motivated versus how women get motivated. Here you go, dog. Is this going to be X-rated? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> is there going to be food involved? Motivational TikTok for girls and motivational TikTok for guys is completely different. Because on the girl side, it sounds like this. You're the prize. You're the queen. Yes, queen. Being your feminine area as you should. Ooh, look at you, girl. Get your lace done. Look at your booty. Do your thing, baby people. You don't need a man. But if you do get a man, he has to be a rich man. I love doing well, rich her. And then men motivational TikTok sounds like this. You're weak. You gotta get off your head. You ain't got no money. You ain't got no beat. You don't drive a Bentley. How many Bugattis you got? What color's your Bugatti? You gotta hit the gym. Get your light back together, next. What if John Cena slaps your mama? What you gonna do? Nothing, cause you're a weak ass, punk ass. Built like an anorexic Jada, pick, pick a smith, look at that. Too broke to get free stuff, look at you. You ain't got no money, get your bag up. Wake up at 5 a.m., go to sleep at, 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 at never. Cause what you mean, sleep is for the week. <laughs> I just love that thing. The little stick person too in the video was just like jacked. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, usually though, like my the ones that I see that are super motivational, like it's got the theme music from Gladiator. Oh, which, nice, like yeah. I love that movie. Of I can't help do. it; it's my favorite movie of all time. And so, um, which like Russell Crowe is built in it, and like the lines he says are just like perfect. Like just excellent movie the whole way through. I love it. Um, and the soundtrack also amazing. Amazing. I, I li- was listening to it last night. I was just like, I feel like Gladiator. <laughs> <laughs> are you not entertained oh my gosh yeah true <laughs> but uh yeah <laughs> and then yeah looking at like girl talk or female tiktok it's like very much that yeah okay. you're a queen <laughs> <laughs> you know it was i showed it to kelsey and she was like yeah like i just find that that just like i, I just find like you met, if that's literally how men traditionally get motivated i think there's just something wrong with you guys and i'm like no nothing wrong with us that's just how we get motivated like just 
we were motivated to be better versions of ourselves. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, sure, part of that's is like how culture over time has like nurtured each sex traditionally. Um, but like, yeah, man, like I don't know, I, I get so fired when people tell me how weak I am and how s- stupid I am. It just makes me just want to prove them wrong. Like yeah. it just fires me up. So I'm, I, I definitely fall into the traditional category on that one. I'm like, My go. favorite line out of that whole thing was, <laughs> "What if John Cena slaps your mom?" <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do about it <laughs> you can do nothing because you're weak <laughs> so oh, man. yeah that was good i appreciate <laughs> that i thought that was a good way to end out today oh yeah for sure awesome well that was a a great show that we uh really loved uh being able to kind of bring to y'all an hour and a half of power on that one for y'all oh, God. here we go it was great so whatever it is you're doing whether you be just trying to enjoy your life in the crazy times that we're in or hitting the gym and making yourself better <laughs> or just going ham because you're weak you're weak whatever you're doing wherever you are we love you we're out peace <laughs>